prisoner, uh, Paul, prisoner and preacher uh, from Ephesians uh, chapter 3. Uh, about 10, maybe 11, 12 years ago, we did a series uh, on Ephesians in Riverside. And uh, this section was, was termed, uh, not by me, but by someone else in the planning group, as it's an open secret. And it's quite interesting when you, you revisit a passage that you spoke on a whole a number of years ago and to see what in actual fact you, you said about it, because I think I've only spoken on it once uh, since then. So just bearing that, that in mind, uh, a wee question for you at the start. Uh, do you remember who these folk were? Joystrings. The joy strings, yeah, right. Uh, I don't have the penny caramels to hurl at you. Remember these days health and safety has interfered with that. Uh, for, for a double, for a bonus uh, point, <laughs> can anybody remember the year? It was 19, yeah, it was 19. And then the next number was six. Very close. 64. 1964 uh, was the, the joy strings. Uh, hopefully this will bring it. Yeah, there we are there. Joy strings, 1964. And they, they had a hit song. I mean, can you imagine such a thing nowadays? Salvation Army having a hit song, you know, on top of the pops and all of that sort of stuff. And the song was, It's an Open Secret. And these, in actual fact, are the lyrics. I'm almost tempted to sing it to you, but I uh, couldn't really compete with Martin's uh, a cappella, and I don't have my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> it's an open secret that Jesus is mine. It's an open secret, this gladness divine. It's an open secret, and I want you to know it's an open secret. I love my Saviour so. And you can seek him, find him, share this secret too. Know his loving kindness in everything you do. It's an open secret. I want you to know it's an open secret. I love my Saviour so. And it was uh, written by uh, Captain Joy Webb at that particular time. And I'm sure those of us of a certain age, it really brings it, brings it back to us. The, the section that we're looking at this evening is almost an interruption in Paul's letter. Uh, as no doubt you've been delving into, you know, very, very sort of theological uh, letter, Ephesians. But suddenly Paul is switching from the Ephesians and uh, the whole wonder of, uh, of, of the gospel. And he starts talking a little bit about himself. And he's bursting with enthusiasm. He can't keep the secret that has been revealed to him. And he's not meant to. Uh, sometimes, you know, we would say to the, the children or people of our vintage to the grandchildren, can you keep a secret? Well, Paul couldn't keep this secret because he's not meant to. Uh, sometimes we discover something really good. You maybe discover a really nice restaurant or a nice hotel or a holiday resort or maybe a bargain. I am a great pursuer of, of bargains. Sometimes we want to keep it to ourselves so other people don't necessarily benefit uh, from it. This is a secret that Paul couldn't keep and neither should we. I think that's at the heart of this, this passage. So we're going to have a look at chapter 3 of Ephesians uh, this evening. I'm reading an actual fact from the New Living uh, Translation this evening. And Paul says, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus because of my preaching to you Gentiles. As you already know, God has given me the special ministry of announcing his favour to you Gentiles. As I briefly mentioned earlier in this letter, God himself revealed his secret plan to me. He mentioned it earlier in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. As you read what I have written, you will understand what I know about this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now he has revealed it by his Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is the secret plan. The Gentiles have an equal share with the Jews in all the riches inherited by God's children. Both groups have believed the good news, and both are part of the same body and enjoy together the promise of blessings through Christ Jesus. By God's special favour and mighty power, I have been given the wonderful privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Just think. Though I did nothing to deserve it, and though I am the least deserving Christian there is, I was chosen for this special joy of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. 
I was chosen to explain to everyone this plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose was to show his wisdom in all its rich variety to all the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. They will see this when Jews and Gentiles are joined together in his church. This was his plan from all eternity, and it has now been carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come fearlessly into God's presence, assured of his glad welcome. So, please don't despair because of what they are doing to me here. It is for you that I am suffering, so you should feel honoured and encouraged. When I think of the wisdom and scope of God's plan, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will give you mighty inner strength through his Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great you will never fully understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now glory be to God. By his mighty power at work within us, he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we would ever dare to ask or hope. May he be given glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever through endless ages. Amen. So how would we come to understand this, uh, this chapter? Uh, pardon the alliteration, uh, but here would be my uh, headings uh, for it. Uh, number one is Paul the prisoner in verse one, and then what I've called Paul the prophet uh, we'll see why I use that in verses 2 to 6. Uh, Paul the preacher, verses 7 to 13. And Paul the prayer, uh, the one who prays. Though we could just as easily call it Paul the prayer, because his life was a prayer. His life was a, a sacrifice and an offering uh, to God. So Paul the prisoner. Uh, I, I love the the commentaries of Warren Wearsby, which I have in my iPad and my, my iPhone, I told you a little bit about one of his references uh, this morning. And I find his observations very helpful. And as regards this chapter, he, he says, I was once a character witness at a child custody trial. Warren Wearsby is an American pastor. He said, I was grateful that the case was being tried at a small rural county seat rather than in a big city because it was my first experience on the witness stand. I have since learned that the location of the court makes little difference. All trials can be difficult and it is no fun to be a witness at any. The prosecutor's first question caught me unawares. Reverend, do you think that a man who has been in prison is fit to raise a child? I was supposed to answer yes or no. So the reply I gave did not make the judge too happy. Well, I said, slowly stalling for time, I guess it depends on the man. Some very famous people have been in jail and have made the world a better place because of their experiences. John Bunyan, for example, he said, famous of course for Pilgrim's Progress in Bedford Jail, and the great Apostle Paul. He said, I could have given other examples from the Bible, but I detected that my answer was not acceptable to the court. Paul is a prisoner and it asks the question, well, why was he in prison? Why was he in prison? And he tells us, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus because of my preaching to you Gentiles. He's in prison because he was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, a group of people who weren't Jews. And the Jews who thought this message was only for them hated him for it. And indirectly, he, he was arrested through their influence. And that is where he ends up in Rome, in, in jail, because he shared the good news with the Gentiles. And the Jews thought they had won. This guy's in jail. We'll have him shut up. No doubt the devil thought he, he had won. Uh, one of the, the gentlemen earlier in our worship talked about the devil thought he had won 
uh, by capturing, as it were, one of the members of the Trinity. The devil thought he had won. Here was this great apostle Paul, and he's in jail. But what does Paul say here? He says he is a prisoner of Christ, not a prisoner of Emperor Nero, not a prison of the Romans, but a prisoner of Christ. You see, Paul knew that his situation was in God's purpose. And what Paul wanted to do was to share in God's purpose. He was seeing the bigger picture. William Barclay, in his commentary, talks about one's point of view makes all the difference in the world. He said, there is a famous story of the days when Sir Christopher Wren was building St. Paul's Cathedral. On one occasion, he was making a tour of the work in progress, and he came upon a man at work and asked him, what are you doing? The man said, I am cutting this stone to a certain size and shape. He came to a second man and asked him what he was doing. The man said, I am earning so much money at my work. He came to a third man at work and asked him what he was doing. The man paused for a moment, straightened himself and answered, I am helping Sir Christopher Wren build St. Paul's Cathedral. That was a man who was sharing in the purpose. And some of you will have had the privilege of being in St. Paul's Cathedral. Jean and I were there a couple of years ago and we went to worship uh, uh, there on the Sunday morning two years ago. And I thought of the story of this man who was sharing in the whole project of building Paul's Cathedral. You see, when we are undergoing hardship or unpopularity or material loss for the sake of our Christian faith and our Christian principles, we can sometimes regard ourselves as the victims of men or we can see ourselves as the champions of Christ Jesus. And Paul here is our example. He regarded himself not as the prisoner of Nero, but as the prisoner of Christ. One of my great uh, heroes is a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, if you want to read a brilliant uh, biography of Bonhoeffer, there's one written by an American called Eric Metaxas, uh, a wonderful account of the life and the ministry and the teachings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who latterly became involved, I suppose we could only describe it as a plot to overthrow Adolf Hitler. Because they saw the bigger picture that this man was a megalomaniac and he was responsible for the death of millions of people. And he became involved, actually, would you believe, in an assassination uh, plot. And he was, he was found out and he was executed just literally days before the end of World War II. Now, one of his famous books is called The Cost of Discipleship. Some of you almost certainly will have it on your bookshelves. The Cost of Discipleship. He wrote it in 1937. And it basically describes his life. And he said this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. The Paul that we're looking at this evening said this, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Bonhoeffer described this as the visible participation of in his cross, the visible participation in his cross. We live in a very interesting country. Uh, some of the history of St. Andrews was really unknown to me until the last couple of years, but last year we, we visited uh, St. Andrews and inevitably I was out on the, on the bike and I stopped just outside St. Andrews Castle and I noticed that in the, the cobbles in the road there, there was the letters GW. And when I investigated, there was a, a notice there just uh, against the fence, and GW stood for George Wishart. And George Wishart was a Protestant reformer who was martyred. He was burnt alive there. He had been hanged on a gibbet, and then his body was burned in that very spot in St. Andrews by a man called uh, Cardinal Beaton. And that led to what you thought, what good can come from that? Well, uh, I'll mention a name, John Knox came from that. Now, he sometimes gets a very bad press, but I don't suspect you and I would be sitting where we are this evening were it not for the influence of John Knox, because uh, some of Wishart's supporters then uh, invaded the castle and they killed Cardinal 
beaten. And John Knox eventually joined them. If you ever visit it, it's a fascinating place. Uh, because their opponents outside the castle couldn't get through to them and they, they started uh, digging a tunnel or a mine underneath the wall of the castle. But the, the Knox and, and his friends inside, they, they knew this was going on. So, so they sunk a countermine and they intercepted it and they stopped that. But the, the perfidious French were enlisted into it and they came with a warship and they bombarded the castle from the sea. And eventually, the, the defenders of the castle had to uh, surrender. And that's when John Knox was sent as a galley slave. But the rest, as you know, is history. Yet you're probably very well aware that the last day of this month, the 31st of October, is the beginning of the Reformation, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis on the church door at, at Wittenberg. These were people who were prepared to put their neck on the line. And because of Paul being in jail, his message would go further. He says, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus, not uh, of Nero or of the Romans. If uh, you wanted to be in a place at this time in history where you could spread the gospel, where would it be? Well, the best place to be was Rome, because it was the heart of the Roman Empire. So this passage that we are looking at is about a very special man, and Paul was a very special man, at a very special time and a very special place. He's in prison, he's in Rome, but because of that, the message would be used to spread because, as we see in the picture, uh, Paul would be chained to Roman soldiers, there would be a whole variety of them, he would share the gospel undoubtedly, people came to visit him, and the word was going forth, and then soldiers would come to far off lands, uh, uh, where barbarians live, like uh, Great Britain, <laughs> and uh, they never made it really much above the Antonine Wall, you know, because of the, the ferocity of, of the Scots. But the gospel spread out because of that, via soldiers and merchants to France and to Britain and so on. You see, the Bible says this in the great story of Joseph. Joseph also ended up in jail, and his brothers thought they had won. But God had his purpose for Joseph, and Joseph eventually says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And Paul is in jail, but because he is in jail, the gospel is not chained. He's chained, but the gospel is unchained, and the gospel is going forth. The interesting thing, if you look at Christian history, is that the more unpopular and difficult it is to be a Christian, the more the message spreads. That seems to be the reality in the world. And that's very relevant to us for moving out of our comfort zone. Worldwide today, thousands of Christians are being arrested, tortured, killed for their faith. And the scandal is our media does not report it. Our media does not report it. Christians are the most persecuted group in the world by far. If you put all the other persecuted groups together, they wouldn't come close to the numbers of Christians who are being persecuted. Christianity is by far the most discriminated against worldview in our own country today. I uh, subscribe to the, the Spectator magazine, which I get weekly on my iPad. It's always a bit of a highlight, you know, I get it on Thursday morning. And there's a very interesting article in this week's Spectator by Charles Moore. And he's talking about the persecution of Christians worldwide and the fact that we don't really get to hear about it. Uh, last week, there was also an interesting article by the irrepressible and outspoken Rod Liddell. Some of you will have come across the writings of Rod Liddell also in, in Spectator, highlighting what is called the whole safe place agenda that is taking place in our society today. Many of our universities are trying to install what they call safe places. Now, these are places where students will not be exposed to anything they don't want them to be exposed to. Now, the big thing that, that Liddell and uh, people like David Robertson of St. Peter's Church in Dundee were highlighting was that in the, the student, uh, there was an attempt by the Student Union of Balliol College in Oxford University 
to stop the Christian Union having a stand at the Freshers' Week. You get Freshers' Weeks at university where, you know, the badminton club will have a stand, you know, and the Gilbert and Sullivan, you know, outfit will have a stand. To, to basically put, put on display all the things that are available in the university. So we're going to have everything, but we're not going to have the Christian Union there. And they tried to stop it. I think there was such a, an outcry that they, they, they couldn't actually uh, act it. But it's happening all over. And Little and I would ask, could you imagine the furore there would be if that ban had been on the Muslim society? Or the LBGT group? If you wonder what that is, that's a lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. And it is probably the case that the attempt to stop the Christian Union in Oxford University was by the LBGT supporters who accused them, quote, of being homophobic. So they could not be allowed to promote Christianity. I want to say this, and I, I believe it passionately, persecution will surely follow the aggressive discrimination that is taking place against Christians in our land today. They're trying to silence us, folks. You see, it used to be hate be behaviour could not be tolerated absolutely correctly. It cannot be tolerated. You can't go about attacking people because you, you don't agree with them. But then the next thing was hate speech. You couldn't express a point of view that contradicted maybe another group's point of view. And some would make a case for that. Now we've moved on to a third stage where it's hate thinking. You're not even allowed to think to hold thoughts in a particular way. Hence the whole attack in the universities to create these safe places where the students won't even be exposed to, for example, the truth of the Christian gospel or the truth of the word of God. That is the kind of society that you and I are living in. A challenge for us as we think of Paul in jail. If being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And so Paul goes on to explain all of this by telling us some details about his life and his calling. And at its centre, at the very core of this, is the fact that he was given a secret plan of what is called the mystery. He said, verse 3, as I briefly mentioned earlier in this letter, God himself revealed his secret plan uh, to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand what I know about this plan regarding Christ. Paul is in prison. Because he did not sit on that plan. That's what he tells us. He did not sit on that plan. He did all in his power to share it. It was an open secret. Which brings us on to our next point, which is Paul the prophet. Uh, I've called uh, this Paul the prophet because a prophet is one who reveals and interprets the hidden things of God. And Paul tells us what this uh, secret plan was. This is the secret plan, verse 6. The Gentiles have an equal share with the Jews in all the riches inherited by God's children. Both groups have believed the good news and both are part of the same body and enjoy together the promise and blessings through Christ Jesus. This is the revelation of, of God to Paul. It, it's always uh, interesting. Where, where do people get a revelation from? You know, what stage in their life did that revelation uh, come. Some of you will have had remarkable experiences in your life. I mean, my call experience when I left teaching to get into full-time ministry is burned right into my psyche because of the fact that God intervened in my life at particular times and particular places and gave me a particular word that this is what he wanted me, me to do. So, so when, when did this happen to, to, to Paul? Well, there is good evidence that it happened at his conversion on the road to Damascus. Now, how do we know this? Because when we, we read further in, in Acts uh, chapter 26, Paul very often would give his testimony and he would tell people, and here he's before a king and he's recounting his conversion. And he says this, we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goods. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you 
to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is all taking place. You know, as Jesus has appeared to Paul in this dramatic intervention in his life. And what does Paul say to Agrippa in verse 19? So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Very, very interesting little statement then. So, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. And Paul was so consumed by the presence and the impact of this message from God and what God wanted to do in his life that he gave his life fully to God to the extent of prison and eventually to death. What is the the practical lesson for us? Uh, The lesson is simply this. Don't be disobedient to God's call on your life. It may be that God is calling you to do something that may require a lot of courage because of the dangerous uh, situations that we're in. It may be uh, to stand up and put our head above the parapet against the insidious advance of the culture of the day which seeks to silence us and seeks to diminish the power of the gospel. So Paul the prisoner and uh, Paul the prophet and then Paul the preacher don't keep the secret So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. This is why he's in jail. This is why he's under arrest. This is why he's now explaining his message to the Ephesian church. So let's just have a brief look at the, the, the Paul the preacher, the messenger, the message, the target group. The first thing to note here is Paul's humility. Ephesians 3 verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's wonderful when you think of the greatness of Paul. He describes himself as a servant. He's a servant of God. He describes himself as less than the least When he writes to Timothy, he describes himself as the chief of sinners. If ever we are privileged to preach or to teach the message of love to others, always remember it's not about us. It's not about our delivery. It's not about how many marks we get out of ten. It's all about Jesus. Uh, Barclay tells uh, a great story about uh, Toscanini, who was one of the greatest orchestral conductors of all time. And once when he was talking to an orchestra, they were preparing to play one of Beethoven's symphonies. And Toscanini said this to them, Gentlemen, I am nothing. You are nothing. Beethoven is everything. You see, he knew that his job wasn't to draw attention to himself or to the orchestra. It was to draw attention to the work. And that is what Paul is saying here. We don't draw attention to ourselves. Is drawing attention and pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we look at the the target group. And Paul says, I've been called to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. Verse 10, his intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Look at the audience that Paul has here. I mean, this is absolutely wonderful. It's to the Gentiles. Yes, very specifically. But it's to everyone, he tells us in verse 9. And then it goes even beyond that as the gospel is sounding forth to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So Paul would stand before earthly kings, but the message was ringing out through the universe to the heavenly realms 
itself. So although Paul was very modest about himself, describing himself as less than the least, describing himself as a servant, he was not modest about his mission. He thought big. So what was his message? Well, his message is, praise Jesus, God's eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here is his message. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. That's, that's the message, folk. His message was Jesus, no other message. And that is our message. We preach Christ and him crucified. It's the only message we have to preach. Now, I have to say this, I believe it's under attack. I believe it's been watered down. I believe it's been diluted. Uh, I believe it's been sidelined, even by people who should know better. But the message we have is Jesus Christ. That is the message that we preached. And that is what Paul preached. God's eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Now finally and very briefly because it's a subject on its own. Paul, the prayer. Uh, I was looking for, for a slide and I put Paul, the prayer. <laughs> And this picture come up, you maybe don't see it very clearly there, but it's the Apostle Paul by Rembrandt. It was painted in 1657, and it shows Paul in jail. And Paul is saying, For this reason I kneel before the Father. Now, Paul has told us in verse 1, For this reason he is a prisoner for his faithfulness to the gospel. And now he tells us, For this reason... Because of this compulsion to preach the gospel, albeit in a difficult situation, for this reason, I pray, I bow the knee, I kneel before the Father for this reason, because Paul knew he could not do this on his own. He knew that only through prayer and through the intervention of God would the gospel go forth. He's a prisoner, he's a prophet, he's a preacher, he's a prayer. And what a prayer! I don't have time to go into it. I'm sure someone else will in the future. But what I did notice, just as I was briefly having a look at this, it's a Trinitarian prayer. I hope people can say that they can't see the Trinity in the Bible when you look at this, you know, is, is beyond belief. He says, I kneel before the Father that he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit. For what purpose? That Christ the Son may dwell in your hearts through faith. And what is the purpose of Paul praying this? I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now, it's not really a case of understanding this, this love. It's a case of grabbing hold of it. Not understanding it, but grabbing hold of it, apprehending it, laying hold of it. And to know this love, that surpasses knowledge. And how does he conclude it? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What a prayer. I want to finish with a, a story. I heard this many, many years ago. I must be going back. Oh, this is really aging me. Between 35 and 40 years ago. Uh, there used to be thought for the day in Radio Clyde. I don't even know if it's still, it's still on, but I vividly remember this story. And the story was told of a minister and his daughter, and he had recently lost his wife and the daughter, her mother. And they, they were on the, one of the Cunard liners going across to America. And the captain knew he was a minister and invited him to conduct one of the services. And he decided, what should I speak on? I will speak on the love of God which in the circumstances was admirable. And he and his daughter were walking in the decks of the liner after the service, and his, his young daughter said to him, Dad, how big is God's love? And he said, oh, it's bigger than anything, dear. But like many youngsters, she wouldn't be put off by that. But how big is God's love, Dad? And he said, well, look around. God's love is wider than the ocean. Look below, God's love is deeper than the sea. Look above, God's love is higher than the heavens. And the little girl said this, isn't it great to know we are in the middle of it? 
We are in the middle of God's love, folks. So we rejoice in that. And that is our impetus to preach the gospel and to be faithful, regardless of what may lie ahead for us individually or corporately or as a country. And then, of course, Paul closes, as we close now, by this great, wonderful doxology in verse 20. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And I wouldn't even dare to add to that again. Okay.